Over the years and decades, NVIDIA have used lots of naming schemes. FX, PCX, GTX, GT, GTS, GTO, and many more. But one card, and one card only, used a GTX Plus branding. So why did NVIDIA give us GTX Plus? Why did it vanish? And how did the card perform? Before we get too far into this video, I just wanted to very, very quickly mention that we now have an RMD Tech Discord server for all of the RMD Tech community. And so check out the link in the video description to go join that. If you are new to the gaming scene, you might be aware that Nvidia currently holds the performance crown. If you want the fastest GPU on the market, Nvidia is your only option, whether you like it or not. But the biggest fight for market dominance largely lies within the mid-range market, and this hasn't changed much since the 9800 GTX Plus release in 2008. Just as they do now, in 2008, Nvidia were the kings of controlling the media headlines. The day before AMD announced their latest mid-range graphics card, the HD 4850, Nvidia dropped the 9800 GTX Plus, catching many reviewers and consumers by surprise. So why did Nvidia release the GTX Plus card? Why weren't they happy with the 9800 GTX that they already had? Well, the 9800 GTX hardly received glowing reviews at the time of release. It wasn't selling well and people just weren't seeing the appeal. It was largely intended to replace the 8800 GTX. However, part of this upgrade included downgrading the memory capacity to 512 megabytes. It almost seems crazy. And so, whilst it was true that the 9800 GTX Plus was able to improve FPS over its replacement, the 8800 GTX, it was never able to shape the fact that the 8800 GTS, whilst older, still performed similarly enough to make the price difficult to swallow for many gamers. So with AMD readying the HD 4850 to take it on directly, Nvidia needed to respond. There are several ways a GPU manufacturer can improve performance without having to redesign a new architecture and GPU. I won't go into those today, however one of those ways is what's known as a die shrink. The 9800 GTX used a 65 nanometer process, while the 9800 GTX Plus used a 55 nanometer process. This enabled Nvidia to relatively easily improve power efficiency and provide a mild stock overclock. To further boost this, the 9800 GTX Plus also came with the ability to reach one gigabyte of memory, beating out the rest of their mid-tier lineup and trashing AMD's lowest end HD 4850, which admittedly did also come in one gigabyte and even two gigabyte variants. So Nvidia were busy improving the king of their mid-tier graphics cards, the 9800 GTX, which was actually just a rebranding of the 8800 Ultra. But was it enough to take on AMD's upcoming HD 4850? Well, Nvidia certainly did a good job stealing the headlines away from AMD that day, but which way did the reviewers of the time suggest consumers went? Team Green or Team Red? Well, many review outlets gave both cards reasonably equal recommendations. However, there was a definite trend towards the HD 4850, which, whilst costing $30 less, also outperformed the 9800 GTX Plus in a lot of areas. At the time of their press release, AMD were also very keen to announce the fact that by the time the 9800 GTX Plus was going to be shipping a month later, AMD would already have started shipping overclocked 4850s which would be able to punish Nvidia further. So who came out of the whole ordeal on top? Well, there is definitely a lot of debate on that. Sure, Nvidia held the performance crown, but this time it looks like AMD really did win the hearts of the consumers with the HD 4850. But none of this explains why Nvidia never actually released another GTX Plus graphics card. The 9800 GTX Plus was the first and the very last. Well, the answer to this unfortunately has no official ending. But as we're all aware, directly after the release of the 9800 GTX Plus, Nvidia rebranded it to the GTS 250. It was here that we saw Nvidia's cards begin to follow the GTX 280's lead and replace the trailing GTX branding with the GTX leading the branding aka going from names such as 9800 GTX to GTX 295. It wasn't until the GTX 500 series we saw the TI suffix introduced. Both the GTX 200 and 400 series cars used an increment of 5 to denote slightly upgraded versions, rather than using either TI or GTX Plus. It seems to be a time that Nvidia was happy to experiment with their branding prior to finally settling on TI. So yes, GTX Plus was short-lived, 
but it was also one of the many predecessors to what would eventually become the mark of a truly powerful graphics card. But let's face it, we all know that you guys don't just come to this channel for a step back through time and a history lesson. You come for benchmarks. And so sure, the 9800 GTX Plus received countless recommendations in 2008. But what happens when I put it into my system with a CPU it could never have dreamt of being paired with when it was released? The Ryzen 3600. I wonder how well it performs. Well, let's face it, we can take a fairly educated guess. So after giving it a good clean, and wow, this graphics card had a hell of a lot of dust in it, I tested this GPU in a variety of games. But it's important for me to note that I'll be using the 341.92 driver rather than the latest driver available on Nvidia's website, as the new driver caused a lot of errors and resulted in significantly lower FPS. For instance, in CSGO, this was the difference between the two drivers. Yikes. As you can see, once I had the less buggy drivers installed, CSGO frame rates became much more playable, jumping from an average of 27 FPS up to 178 FPS average. However, as is usually the case with my benchmarks, Wreckfest proved more resource demanding than you might have expected, and so here we saw our FPS absolutely tank. I was able to add Payday 2 to our lineup for the first time ever, and I was really surprised by how well it ran on this card. Sure, it had a bit of stuttering, but ultimately it was a really, really playable experience. Speaking of which, Rocket League once again runs on absolutely anything, giving us a solid 60 FPS plus at 1080p. Once I'd actually turned the settings down as low as I possibly could, I was also able to run Grand Theft Auto 5. And I tell you what, it may have been piss poor graphics quality, but I really enjoyed this experience. And if I had to, and I really do mean had to, I could easily play like this. Just maybe try to avoid large explosions if you can. Minecraft also ran really well, but I won't talk too much about that, as that is a mostly CPU intensive game that, well, this GP doesn't have much of an effect on. Dota 2 also gave us a reasonable playing experience, but thanks to it being fairly undemanding, we were able to boost up to 1080p medium settings whilst maintaining more than 30 FPS average. I'd also been hoping to test the Halo Master Chief collection, however unfortunately this gave us a warning at the launch of the game, which actually ended up coming true. The game crashes fatally every time you try to get anywhere past the main menu, so unfortunately no like this time Halo fans. And so like many of the graphics cards I test, it's 2020. Of course this GPU won't be useful for modern gaming titles, but if you do fancy playing some older titles, you will absolutely love using this card, especially considering that unlike its main competitor, the HD 4850, it still has native Windows 10 support, even if it is a bit buggy. If you fancy a neat piece of history, pick up one of these cards, but keep it on display on the shelf, not in your PC. It will be much better suited there. And now for the wrap up. It's the time of the video where everyone clicks off. But if for whatever reason you haven't done that yet, please do consider hitting the subscribe button if you do enjoy this type of content. And if you haven't already, as I mentioned earlier, I do now have a Discord server, so go ahead and join that too. I can't wait to chat with you guys on there.